Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and that, of course, means it is time for our midweek Bible study. We're happy to share that with all of our extended members, our online family, via the web. And I hope that you'll take the next 90 minutes or so <clears throat> and set it aside to explore and understand and benefit from the Word of God. Like us, if we would tonight, to go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible study. If you'll bow your heads with me, Master, we love you, God, today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to delve into the Word of God. There is no greater trove of treasure that we as the children of God are afforded than the precious word of the Lord. Master, tonight in the name of Jesus, I ask God that you would loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, that you might guide me in teaching, that you might guide the listener in hearing. Allow our hearts, our minds, our very spirit today to be open to receive that which we hear from the Word of God. Master, today we need in this late hour, it's late in the day, we need to understand these things. For Lord, things are about to get rather crazy and hectic in our world, and we need to be informed, we need to understand. Oh God, the Word of God promises you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We ask all this tonight in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to remind... <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. I want to remind folks that Tommy and I will be traveling to... Paducah, I believe that's how you pronounce it, P-A-D-U-C-A-H, uh, Kentucky, this weekend for uh, a conference. We will have church Sunday. Uh, to be honest with you, we recorded an additional service last Sunday after our service, uh, our regular service so that we would have one, as they say in Hollywood, in the can uh, for this Sunday. So it's already scheduled and ready to uh, broadcast. And I believe it will be a big blessing to you. We are going to finish this coming Sunday the message that I began last week. Uh, what will you inherit? And I believe... I believe that was a powerful, important message, folks. So uh, be certain to join us Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. This evening, I want to do something in the way of a... Um, I'm not sure we might not just finish up our study tonight, and that will be 20 sessions in this particular study. We may do it again in the future. If we do it in the future, it may be like it was years ago in uh, uh, Dallas. Uh, you know, we may wind up doing it in the future and it'll be very different uh, than it was even this time. Because this time was very different than it was the last time. Of course, the last time when we did it in Dallas, we did have uh, a church audience, and that makes things uh, quite a bit different. And uh, that's one reason why it, it's important to have an audience. It actually helps um, the process. Um, but I think this has been good. I hope it's been informative and enlightening for many of you. We would love to get your feedback on it. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to kind of go over a quick um, synopsis of what 
we have seen in regard to uh, ghosts and hauntings in particular and uh, I, I want to go through many of the points that we've covered through the course of our study kind of want to run through them point by point and then um, what we want to do is we want to look at some other paranormal phenomena as it um, relates to the uh, information that we know about the ghosts and hauntings aspect of things. And you might say, well, preacher, I don't quite know what you mean. Well, what I mean is this. The the things that we have learned so far that apply to ghosts and hauntings, if you look at it and, and you look at the parallels, you'll be able to see that these same exact principles, these same exact truths apply to any number of um, paranormal um, manifestations, whether it be Bigfoot, whether it be uh, past life regression, whether it be um, uh, aliens and alien abduction, all of these truths apply across the board. And you'll see where there are very easily, you're very easily able to draw parallels and understand, aha, that's right, these things here work in the same way as the hauntings and the ghosts issues work. So tonight we want to begin, I want to begin, of course, at the reality, the first reality that we looked at when we started our study is the biblical reality that, yes, the spirit world is absolutely real. There is no question from a biblical perspective whether or not uh, the spirit realm, as it were, exists. It absolutely exists. We understand that within the spirit realm, there are two categories of spiritual beings. Uh, they fall under the titles angels and demons. Uh, angels and demons are all, in effect, angels. However, we simply use the term angels when uh, we speak of those angels um, that are on the good side, as it were, versus demons, which are those angels which operate on the negative side or the wicked evil side, Satan's side. Angels are in God's employment. He is uh, the one who created them. They answer to him. Demons are in God's employment. He created them, and they answer to him. Uh, so it is not that uh, one side is, you know, under uh, Satan's uh, authority, and the other side is under God's authority. No, that's not how it works. However, they have been given, demons have been given a specific mission. They have been given specific rights. They have been given certain parameters that they must operate within. And God allows them that because he created them in an effort to give humanity the option between good and evil. Humanity could not have chosen between good and evil if evil did not exist. God wants an eternal love interest. He wants a wife, as it were, okay? And he wants every... I, I explained this to a young man who was born and raised Jehovah's Witness one time, and he told me that it made so much sense to him and it really helped him a great deal uh, to understand because he said, you know, I don't understand why God would create us and then 
there would be so much conflict in the world and there'd be so much negativity and why is it that he would create us and then it would be so difficult for us to navigate our way through life spiritually and and uh, to secure our place in his kingdom. Now, of course, you have to remember, he also was speaking from a Jehovah's Witness perspective, which is, you know, it's virtually impossible for anybody to be saved in the end. So, uh, it, you know, he was coming from, a, sadly, a very negative, very downtrodden place in his thinking. And uh, I explained to him what I'm about to explain to you now. God wants a bride, okay? Not something or someone that he has created specifically to serve him, to love him. He wanted um, a bride that would choose to love him in the same way that any one of us wants someone. We don't want someone who loves us because we're wealthy. We don't want somebody loving us simply because we're handsome or uh, we're successful. We want somebody to love us for us. And uh, God had created the angelic realm. He had created servants who did his bidding and served him, and his will was their will. But he wanted to create a love interest that he could literally occupy heaven throughout eternity with, but he wanted, listen to me carefully, he wanted every cell of her body, as it were, to have chosen to love him, to serve him, had chosen and desired to be with him. You see, we look at salvation and we look at redemption. We look at the issues in the Word of God as though it is an individual thing because for each of us it is an individual thing in this life. We individually have to make a choice to live for God, to serve God, to love God. But there is this collective truth that exists. And when we are united with the Father in heaven, each and every child of God is going to become, in effect, not, I, don't, I don't want somebody running out and trying to misrepresent what I'm about to say, but in effect, we are each going to become a cell in the singular body of the Bride of Christ. So collectively, we will become the Bride of Christ. And as the Bride of Christ, every single cell of her body, every single individual that makes up the Bride, is going to be with him because they have chosen to do so, because they love him, and they have desired to be with him. So therefore, we go through this process in this life where these little microscopic things uh, compared to God who declares that heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. We're all these little microscopic things. But over the course of time, over the course of millennium, <clears throat> over the course of the ages, God has created a collective of individual uh, souls who desire to love him and be with him. This is why throughout the Old and New Testament, the constant call uh, from the Lord is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. 
we're to love God with a fervor, with a passion. If we're going to be part of the bride of Christ, we have to love God with a passion. If you want to understand the kind of passion that God desires we love him with, then you can look at the book, song, um, The Song of Solomon. And a lot of people look at this and they think, well, you know, this book is crazy. It's, you know, it's very uh, unusual and odd. And I don't quite understand uh, what's being conveyed here. But what God is in effect doing is describing the romantic love relationship that he is to have with his church. Okay, so... When you understand this, you understand that God had to create an alternate. He had to create uh, an opposite. He had to create, in effect, competition. And he knew what he was doing from the get-go. He knew that many souls, many people were going to choose to wind up falling in love with his competition. But that's okay, because if you'd rather love that, if you'd rather love this world, if you'd rather love the temporal than the eternal, if you would rather ignore the, uh, the spiritual aspect of your being, which God created you with, if you want to ignore that and live your life as though this is all there is and this is all we have, then that's all well and good. God is looking for people who are able to grab hold of the concept of the spiritual, grab hold of the concept of the eternal, and all of the things that we see within the Christian faith, they may seem to be very... Um, you know, when we talk about the cross, when we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when we talk about in the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood, these things may seem very physical. They, they you know, a lot of times people reduce them uh, to, to something very simple and uh, very natural. But what they don't understand, Jesus said as he spoke about his body and his blood and the need for uh, saints to uh, eat his body and drink his blood. And this sounded so vulgar and it sounded so gross to those that were listening to him. But he said to them, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are light. He said, Y'all aren't getting this. You're not understanding this. I'm not simply talking about um, physical things within a physical context, but I'm using physical things to illustrate a much higher, a much deeper, a much more complex, a much more important spiritual concept and spiritual precept. So, God created, as it were, competition. He is the king over the kingdom of God. He created a creature that was to serve as the king or the overseer of this world. And the Lord came in and said, I'm going to do something that human beings in their very limited carnal fleshly mind can grasp and understand. I'm going to do something <clears throat> in such a way that they will be able to understand it. Nobody understands uh, anything better than the concept of someone laying down their life for, your, for, for another he said, if I go, if I take on a human form and I go and I purposefully, willingly, submissively, humbly lay down my life on the cross of Calvary 
and I express and make clear through prophecy, through uh, the prophets of old, and if I make clear through my own teaching and my own uh, expounding that this is necessary in order to make those who will believe and accept what I have done for them a part of my bride and a part of the church, said uh, they can wrap their head around the idea of somebody dying for them. But of course, being God, the Apostle Peter said on the day of Pentecost that it was not possible that death could keep him in the grave. It was not possible, folks. If Jesus Christ had merely simply been a man, then it certainly would have been possible for death to retain him. But because, according to Paul, to Timothy, uh, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Because Jesus Christ was Jehovah God himself, come to manifest himself in human form, to introduce himself to us, to reveal himself to us. Because he did this, um, and because he was in fact God, the spirit that dwelled within the man Christ was not a spirit separate from God. No, the only spirit. You and I have a spirit. We have a spiritual identity. My spiritual identity is Charles. Tommy's spiritual identity is Tommy. Jesus Christ only possessed the Spirit of God, which is why the Apostle Paul wrote, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. This is why Jesus said over and over again, the words that I speak, the things that I do, said everything that I do and say, he said it all comes at the direction of the Father. God is a spirit. God is not a person. He is not a man. He is a spirit. So God in Christ, the spirit of God in Christ, again the apostle Paul telling Timothy, uh, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But the very next words, justified in the spirit, meaning in spirit he was flawless. He was perfect. There was absolutely nothing found in him that was wrong. There was not a spot nor a blemish. Uh, in his spirit because the spirit of God occupied the man Jesus Christ. And this is how God then chose to reveal himself to humanity and in effect to woo us. And this was his effort at um, courting us. When you look at the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ, I don't know how in the world anybody on this planet could not fall in love with him. Um, but at the same time, in order for humanity to make a choice, it was necessary that there be, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, competition. There had to be another option. Okay? And the enemy, Satan, and his kingdom, which God established uh, to be that competition, as it were, they don't fight for your love so much as they are trying simply to rob God of any more who might love him and serve him and believe in him and have faith in him so that they too might one day be part of the bride of Christ. So their whole motivation is not 
that you would love him, Satan. No, Satan said, I would be his God. He said, I want to sit in the temple as God. I want to be worshipped. Satan's desire is to be worshipped. He is the ultimate narcissist. He wants a body of people who are going to worship him, not a body of people who are going to love him. Love is not part of Lucifer's motivation. Okay, So therefore, he wants to get as many as he possibly can who will simply ultimately worship him. And being a narcissist, he tends to lean toward beating people into submission. He tends to lean into pressuring people into submission uh, rather than wooing them. The Word of God tells us it is the goodness of God, the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. The Word of God tells us that if we are to come to God, we must first believe that He is, that He exists, and secondly, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the gospel is not that God exists and he wants you to be afraid of him because judgment's coming. That whole message is a false message. That whole message is a wrong message. That message does not draw us into a love relationship with the Lord. The Apostle Paul said, we love him because he first loved us. Everything about the gospel, everything about the teachings of Jesus Christ was focused on the love of God. The most popular scripture that most people have known since they were a child, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then look at the next phrase, the next passage. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it is the goodness of God. It is God's love that he wants you to respond to. Sadly, so many in the church today have polluted and convoluted this message to the point that it is sickening. And the reason for that is, the Lord said, in the last days, he said, there'd be many false prophets, there'd be many false teachers. He said, in fact, there would be so many and they would be so effective in doing what they do that the way of truth would be evil spoken of. In other words, these false teachers and these false preachers have so perverted and polluted the Christian message that the message now has become evil spoken of. People don't have anything good to say about Christianity. They don't have anything good to say about the church. They don't have anything good to say about the gospel because people under the influence of false teachers and false preachers have turned the message of God's love and grace into a message of condemnation and guilt and fear and judgment. So having said that, Angels serve at God's bequest. The Word of God said they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister on behalf of the children of God. So angels are ministering spirits. They do positive things. They do helpful things. There have been any number of uh, accounts over the centuries of people who have been in, in great peril 
and some individual suddenly appeared to them and helped them out of their struggle, maybe helped them out of a car that was on fire or helped them out of underneath a building that had collapsed or any number of different scenarios. And then as soon as they were safe, they look around and they're looking for this person and this person is gone. And the Word of God tells us to be careful how we interact with strangers. It uses the word in the King James, entertain strangers, because many have entertained or many have interacted with angels not being aware that it was an angel they were interacting with. That homeless person on the side of the uh, the, the parking lot at the restaurant you go into uh, that you clearly can identify as someone who's homeless and struggling, that person may very well be an angel. And God is looking to see, are my people going to do what I've called my people to do? Are they going to offer this man something to eat? You know, I don't carry cash. I only use debit cards and credit cards. I don't carry cash hardly ever. So when I go to a restaurant or I go into a store, if there's a homeless person there, uh, I'll ask them. I'll say, listen, if you want to come in, I, I don't carry cash. If you want to come in, I'll be more than happy to buy you something to eat. I'll be more than happy to help you get some resources. You know, there are, there are ways, folks, that we can do these things. But angels are there to minister positive, to minister good on behalf of the Lord. Then demons are there, and their only purpose in this universe is to deceive and you need to remember this. That is their only purpose. And because that is their only purpose, they do so without any reservation. They do so without any limitations. They don't care what it takes. They don't care how they go about it. They are going to be deceptive. Uh, this is why we must be so careful to place the full and the whole of our confidence in the Word of God. This is not about, folks, approaching a book that God has given us from a legalistic perspective. No, this is about putting faith and confidence in what God has told us, in the instruction that God has offered us. Why? Because there are angels. Jesus said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. He didn't say, I send you forth as sheep with a wolf in the pack. No. He said, I'm literally sending you out. You are the minority and the wolves are the majority. So there are far more wolves than there are sheep, okay? And he said, you're going into very perilous territory. And for this reason, from a spiritual perspective, we must place and keep our confidence in the Word of God and the Word of God alone. Anything that contradicts what God has instructed us, anything that contradicts what God has told us, we must reject. And that includes uh, so-called evidence that we might glean from the spirit realm, whether that be through so-called ghosts or so-called hauntings. Now, we learned through the course of our study that both angels and demons are capable of fully, physically, flesh and blood manifesting themselves within the physical world. Even to the extent, again, when we go back to the story of Noah, even to the extent that demonic spirits were able to interact with women and create children. 
Well, you can't do that, obviously, unless you're literally able to take on a human form that is capable of full copulation. Okay? So, obviously, if what we read in Genesis is true, then demons and angels, because as we said, the Word of God said, be careful how you entertain strangers, so on and so forth. They're not there as a spiritual entity. They're appearing to you as an honest-to-God person, okay? So, angels and demons have the ability to appear in a literal, physical, flesh-and-blood form. They also have the ability to appear as anything they would like. They can choose to manifest themselves however they wish to manifest themselves. Interestingly enough, we have people who call themselves paranormal experts who will tell you that all these magic powers, so to speak, become ours after death, and that after death, People all of a sudden uh, have all these magical abilities. Well, that's all well and good. It's all sweet. It sounds good. The only problem is, is that what the Word of God teaches? No, that is not what the Word of God teaches. Now listen, we have studied during the course of this study so far, demons require permission whether it be intended or not intended to be able to access an individual or to affect their lives, we must somehow, some way, open a door to demonic activity. As a child of God, if we're living our Christian experience according to the Word of God, listen, if we're following the mandates of God's Word, then we have nothing to fear. Because if we live our lives in a biblical Christian manner, if we respond and react to people and circumstances in a biblical Christian manner, then the door will never open to any spirit so that they might come in and begin to influence or affect us. Again, there are three levels of demonic activity. There is vexation, there is oppression, there is possession. Uh, generally, of course, a believer, a genuine, genuine believer, someone who has genuinely been born again according to the biblical mandate, according to the biblical standard, for salvation, which we believe to be Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There are many people in our world today run around calling themselves born-again Christians. They prayed the sinner's prayer. They prayed the prayer after Franklin Graham or after Billy Graham or after some preacher on television. And they felt good for having done it. They felt like God came into their life, and he did. He did. When we, the Word of God says, draw nigh unto God and He will draw nigh unto you. However, um, walking newly in fellowship with the Lord does not make you born again. There are many people who are not even Christians who study the teachings of Christ and believe that those teachings are good and that that is the way human beings ought to live. There are many people who are not even Christians, for instance, who embrace the concept of nonviolent protest and what have you, based on the example of Jesus Christ. But have they obeyed the gospel? No, they have not obeyed the apostolic mandate, the apostolic message preached by the early church throughout the entire 
book of Acts, we see over and over again this same model, this same message, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sin, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. We see this over and over and over again in the book of Acts, the only historical book in the New Testament that we have. And um, so there are many people out there who call themselves born-again Christians, and sadly, they believe they're born again. But they have not fulfilled God's requirement for the genuine biblical born-again experience. Jesus said in a prophetic sense to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water, water baptism, Spirit, Holy Ghost baptism. In Hebrews 6, the Apostle Paul said, laying aside the uh, fundamentals, the foundation of our faith, repentance toward God, and uh, the doctrine of baptisms, plural. So there are many people who believe in the Lord, who follow the Lord's teaching. And does God work with them? Does God uh, draw close to them? Does he try to bring them closer to himself by drawing closer to them? Yes, he does. Anyone who seeks after God, he will do this for. But they have not genuinely been born again. In the meantime, if and when they have opened a door to the enemy, they actually allow for either vexation, which is the mildest form, you might say, of demonic uh, activity in an individual's life. It is external. It is a bothering. It is a troubling. It is making uncomfortable. Um, it is uh, all about... Um, vexing and um, troubling and making you miserable. That's vexation. Then you have oppression. Oppression implies that there has been an attachment, that the spirit no longer is merely kind of poking at you and, you know, kind of trying to cause you uh, grief. But now this spirit has literally attached itself to you. It has made you its mission. And it is present every day, all day. And with oppression, that spirit, depending on the nature of the spirit, every spirit is identified by the work that it does. You know, we got these people running around. What is your name, demon? What is your name? You know, oh, my name is... Folks, that is so stupid. It's not even funny. Demons, just like human beings, have names which are uh, born of profession or lineage, family lineage, whatever the case might be. You know, you have uh, John Carpenter, okay? Obviously, somewhere in his history, somewhere in his family lineage, uh, somebody was a carpenter, and that wound up becoming an identifier for his uh, ancestor, and ultimately it became his last name. That doesn't mean today that he's a carpenter, but uh, in his history, somebody certainly was a carpenter. Um, I have an aunt who married a man whose last name was Parson. Well, Parson is a minister, a preacher. And somewhere in his lineage, there was uh, someone who worked as a minister, as a preacher, probably in Great Britain. And this title wound up becoming uh, part of his identifier. It became part of his name. Uh, you name a child according to whatever desire, whatever will you have to name it. John, Bill, Fred, Phil, Frank, Joe. Uh, but the last name is inherited. It comes down. Well, the same thing is true of the spirit realm. A spirit is identified by the work that spirit engages in. And listen, we talked about the fact that the spirit realm is extremely 
organized and structured. There are levels of power. There are levels of authority. Some spirits are much more powerful. Some are less powerful. Uh, but each spirit is identified by the work it does. Um, there are spirits who all they do is promote depression. All they do is drive people, constantly causing people to think negative thoughts and uh, constantly uh, causing people to feel helpless, to make them feel alone, to make them feel uh, depressed and despondent. And each spirit works in one specific area. So now you have a spirit of depression, but you can also have a spirit of loneliness. You also can have a spirit of despair. You also can have a spirit of despondency. Those spirits are in effect less powerful. They're kind of at the lower end of the spectrum. They work within the realms of human emotion and their, their whole desire is to drive you in a certain direction because there is a more powerful spirit. If they can push you in a certain direction, there is a more powerful spirit that they then can uh, help you to open the door to. What spirit might that be? Might be a spirit of, of murder. You become so depressed, you become so despondent, you become so upset with what's going on in the world or what's going on at school or what's going on at your job that all of a sudden a murderous spirit, a spirit of murder is able to come in and then that spirit now is using all that these spirits are doing to drive you specifically in the direction of murder, taking someone else's life. Another thing it might do is cause, uh, open the door for a spirit of suicide, a suicidal spirit. And uh, believe me, folks, I've, I have rebuked enough suicidal spirits in my day uh, over people and seen people who struggled with uh, depression and suicidal thoughts and all these sorts of things. For years they struggled. And I mean, these poor people were hanging on by a thread. And when they finally got into a place where the minister of the gospel or somebody in the church had discernment of spirits and was able to call that spirit out and rebuke it and to cast it forth in the name of Jesus on behalf of that individual who was oppressed who this spirit had attached itself to, all of a sudden, boom, that attachment was broken. And they were able to walk free of that depression, free of that despondency, free of that uh, suicidal thinking. This is why I have said over and over and over again, and I say it every day, we need the church. You need the church. The gifts of the Spirit operate through the body of Christ. We minister to one another. We help one another. And when you are in a good, Holy Ghost-filled, empowered church, it, it doesn't have to be a preacher. I've had many an occasion where one of the saints that I loved and admired and appreciated was able to come to me. Uh, maybe I was struggling and I went into the altar and I was praying and crying out to God and one of the saints in the church would feel led to come down and pray with me. And all of a sudden in the course of their praying, they began to pray according to a word of knowledge, meaning God allowed them to see and understand something that they would not in the natural see or understand. And they literally would begin to pray about something specific in my life that they didn't even know. 
They didn't know anything about I never talked to them about it. I never told them a word about it. I don't know how on earth they could possibly know. Or maybe they begin to pray according to uh, discernment of spirits. They're able to discern that there is something going on here of a spiritual nature. And immediately that believer, who I want to shout, who I love, I love this work of God in the church. It is a glorious thing. That's why I keep trying to tell people, let me tell you, the enemy has been fighting this ministry for decades because it knows that if we ever could get a church like this preacher has a vision for, we would whoop his butt. And he knows it. He knows we would tear him up one side down the other. And uh, people would be delivered from demons. People would be healed and saved and filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And he fights us like it's going out of style because he knows. This preacher understands. I know what I'm teaching, folks. I know what I'm talking about. This isn't coming out of off the top of my head. This is uh, the byproduct of decades of working in these areas. But demons... Uh, are given permission, for instance. We can give a, a, a spirit of depression permission. How? Because instead of recognizing early that it is the spirit of depression that's trying to vex us, we wind up kind of nurturing it and we kind of coddle it and we decide that we'd rather sit and uh, bask in our depression. This is one reason why, again, I say we need the church. We need body ministry. We need to be in a place where the gifts of the Spirit are flowing. Because there are times when we do this and we are being vexed by a spirit of depression. We're being vexed by a spirit of anxiety. We're being vexed by a spirit of fear. And we, and, and, and folks, I go through this myself. We don't see it for what it is. We don't look at it for what it is. And we wind up kind of deciding we want to coddle it a little bit. We're, you know, we're going to get in bed with it, so to speak. And if we're in a good Holy Ghost church, guess what? One of our fellow believers can see, they can discern, God can give them a word of knowledge, and they can minister to us so that we quickly close that door. I've told this story before when I was a teenager in Texas. God called me to Texas when I was 16 years old. I had never lived away from home a day in my life. Um, I can't say I was real excited about the idea of doing so at 16, but the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to prepare you for your ministry. And uh, in order to do this, I need to get you and I alone. Like Paul went aside for three years and he and the Lord alone uh, went through a period of training and preparation for his ministry. And this was the Lord calling me aside so that I could be away from family. I could be away from everything that I had known. All of the things in this life that offered me security, he pulled me away from and he brought me to a new place. He brought me somewhere brand new. I had to meet new people. I had to make new friends. I had to establish myself in a new church. I mean, everything was new. So there was so much that I had to do and so much I had to learn to do. I went through a number of experiences from uh, being homeless for a period of time to uh, struggling to pay rent, go to school, go to church, and try to graduate high school, uh, went through difficulties with family members, you know, went through all kinds of different experiences. And the Lord said to me, if you're going to preach faith, then you need to know how to live by faith. And so this time in Texas was a time of preparation for me. Well, as a young person, I was very prone. I grew up in a very hideous household. My father was a demonic narcissist 
who was hell-bent on destroying his wife and destroying his kids psychologically, mentally. It was terrible, folks. He hated God. He hated church. He hated anything to do with religion. He came against my faith every day of my life, telling me that my faith was stupid, it was useless, it was idiotic, that th that religion was a bunch of crap and blah, blah, blah. That's what I grew up. I didn't grow up in an ivory tower with a Holy Ghost filled praying mom who shouted in church every Sunday, danced in the house, came home, prayed at her bedside, and shouted down the glory of God. Somebody I could run to when things were difficult, and she'd grab me by the hand and begin to pray with me about it. That wasn't the life I lived. That wasn't the experience I had. So I grew up in a very negative, very horrific, and the enemy took full advantage of it. And without my even knowing, uh, he made certain that I was continually vexed, if not oppressed, by a spirit of depression. I felt growing up as a kid, every morning I woke up, literally, I there were so many mornings I woke up and I said, oh God, not again, literally. I didn't even want to wake up in the morning. I didn't even want to face what I was going to have to face. I was horribly uh, bullied and made fun of in school. I had a terrible nervous tick, terrible nervous condition between the ages of 8 and 16. I mean, folks, I went through a lot of adversity, even as a young person. So I wrestled with depression a lot. And, uh, and deep depression. I never experienced suicidal thoughts until after I was about 18. That's, that's when all of a sudden suicidal thoughts began to come in. But prior to that, I can say, thank God, I never had a, a suicidal thought. I used to beg the Lord not to let me wake up, but I wasn't going to kill myself. And, uh, Long story short, I'm living in Texas by myself. Some of you have heard this story before. And um, I go to church one day. I can't remember if it was a Sunday or a Wednesday, but uh, the pastor, Brother Gillum's grandson, was preaching that night. He was an evangelist, and he had come through town, and Brother Gillum was going to have him preach that night. And I was under such a weight of depression, my God, I felt like I couldn't, I, if I looked up, I'd see the heel of somebody's shoe. I was just so deeply depressed and despondent. At the end of the service, uh, they were having an altar service and Brother Gillum's grandson invited people that wanted prayer to come down and what have you. And I sat there and I, I just couldn't even find the motivation to get up and go ask for prayer. I, I You know, I'm going to tell you folks, depression is, is a powerful, I will say this, depression is an extremely powerful spirit. Um, not as powerful as, for instance, a spirit of witchcraft or a spirit of the occult. Uh, or a spirit of magic, but it's it's a very powerful spirit, which is why it's in the upper echelons as you go up the line. So anyway, at one point, Sister Bruce, who ultimately became like an adopted mom to me, a lady, a very spiritual, oh, marvelous, Holy Ghost-filled preacher lady, she and her husband and kids attended the Riverside Church at this time, and she came over to me and she took me by the hand. She said, come on, Chuck, we're going to go get you prayed for. And Sister Bruce was a big lady. She was she wasn't little. She was big. And I respected and admired her immensely. And I just, I didn't fight her. I wasn't gung-ho per se about going up to get prayed for at the moment, but I didn't fight her. So I took her hand and I walked with her. We went up. And as we were walking up to the front of the church, Brother Kerry looked at me and he said, You old spirit of depression, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And he went to put his hand forward to put it on my head. And he got about this close to my head. And the Holy Ghost, whoo, glory, the power of God hit me. And my, I went back on my back like somebody had hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Brother Kerry hadn't even laid his hand on me, had he? 
Woo! Glory hadn't even touched me. And I felt the power of the Holy Ghost like you cannot imagine. And I hit that floor. And honey, I lay there. I don't know how long I lay there. But the Lord and I just, oh, the Spirit of the Lord just ministering to me, ministering to me. When I got off that floor, I want to tell you something. I had the joy of the Lord restored. Oh, hallelujah. I felt hopeful. I wasn't looking at everything from a negative perspective. I wasn't seeing everything uh, as being bad and dismal. God delivered me from that spirit of depression that day. This is why we need the church. This is why the first deception of the enemy, and in these last days he has been powerfully successful in convincing Christians. Well, you know, you can just stay at home and watch the preacher on TV. You can just stay at home and watch the preacher on the internet. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to be physically uh, in company with other believers. And you don't physically need to fellowship with the rest of the body. Wrong, 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 wrong. Half of the struggles, half of the battles that you go through, God could address and minister to if you would do things his way and fellowship with the body of Christ. I'm, I've got all kinds of thoughts going through my head, but I don't want to get too far off track here tonight. Okay, so demons, uh, demons will generally seek out and afflict the most spiritually vulnerable. And this, my friend, can include children right down to infancy. I'm going to say this tonight. There are some of you that have children and your child is already being afflicted and uh, if not oppressed at the very least vexed by spirits some of you are married to people who have spiritual attachments and your child cannot help but be in the company of that individual they can't help it you married them and every day you put your child in the company of your husband, your wife, that is under a spiritual attachment and oppression of the enemy, whether that be a spirit of anger, whether that be a spirit of bitterness, whether that be a spirit of revenge, whether that be a spirit of murder, whether that be a spirit of um, um, Rebellion, I, I, I knew the word, just couldn't think of it. Whatever it is that your spouse is oppressed by and attached to, that spirit now is vexing your child. And that child is going to grow up with an attachment, it, not a vexation, Ultimately, it's going to become because they're vulnerable, they're weak, they don't understand spiritual things. They are ultimately going to wind up with an oppression just like daddy. They're going to have that same spirit of anger. They're going to have that same spirit of rebellion. They're going to have that same spirit of bitterness that daddy has. And you need this is a word from the Holy Ghost right now. I know people who need to do this. You need to lay your hands daily on your baby's head and pray over that child. Say, God bless my baby with a clear mind, with clear thoughts. Help my child to walk, to find a relationship with you as he or she grows older. And in the name of Jesus, I bind every vexation of the enemy and I command it to loose its hold in Jesus' name. Folks, you need to do this. I have met 
babies that people have. And I've seen behaviors in that child, and I'm going to tell you something. I know that it is not a natural behavior. I know that the behavior I'm seeing is being egged on, as it were, and encouraged by demon spirits. And um, But as their parent, you need to take authority. You need to recognize you're the only spiritual covering your child has. And they need you to protect them and to guard them uh, from any form of vexation or oppression. Now, in that vein, a parent... Uh, Apparent spirituality is the only covering or protection that a child has until they're able to establish for themselves a walk with God. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Now, in terms of ghosts and the concept of a ghost, we understand that a ghost cannot be the spirit of a human being cannot be. As human spirits, according to the Word of God, are relegated to God's control after death. They cannot choose to stay. They cannot become confused and get stuck. No. Where's God? According to that mentality, that teaching, According to that thought process, God is non-existent. He's not even paying attention to us. He's just letting us float through the world on our own. And that's what the enemy wants people to believe, which is why we have, since the beginning of man, we've had this concept of ghosts. This is something that has been around since the beginning of the world. We see on any number of occasions where uh, in scripture even, where people um, experience something that was happening in the natural, Jesus walking on the water to the disciples on the boat. It was literally happening in the natural. But what did they think? They thought they saw a ghost. Uh, Peter is delivered from prison by an angel, and he goes to the house of the saints, uh, to the house where the saints are praying and knocks on the door. And the homeowner goes to the door. She's so excited hearing Peter's voice, but she's absolutely convinced it can't be Peter. He's in jail. So she runs back in the house and says, oh, uh, Peter's ghost must be outside because I'm hearing his voice. So the concept of a ghost, the belief in spiritual things being manifest in the human realm is certainly found in Scripture. Is there any endorsement of that? Is there any offering that ghosts are legitimate or real? No. Every time people thought they saw a ghost or assumed they were seeing a ghost, it turns out there was a natural explanation. There was something really happening. But somehow, some way, people had to develop this concept of a ghost. Well, we know going back to the Law of Moses that necromancers and people, mediums and psychics and those who attempted to communicate with the dead through articles of divination, we know that these things existed going all the way back into antiquity. These things, <coughs> excuse me one more time, I apologize. Articles of divination, uh, meddling in the spirit realm, inviting spirits to interact with you and communicate with you. These are all ways that demons uh, receive an invitation and an open door to come in and begin to operate. So if we know that going back to antiquity, people engaged in these things, then you better believe the same kind of demonic activity, the same kind of so-called ghosts, the same kind of so-called hauntings that we see today were going on 5,000 years ago. Okay? So, um, 
But we know according to the word of God, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We know according to the word of God that at the moment of death, the spirit of man returns to God, becomes God's possession, it becomes God's property to do with as he pleased. We know from the example of scripture, there are two destinations for the human spirit. And uh, they can either wind up in the presence of God to be absent from the Lord, uh, excuse me, to be absent from the body, the word of God declares, is to be present with the Lord. So nowhere does Paul say to be absent from the body. Um, we can either be stuck here on earth or we can choose to stay here or we can be in God's presence. No, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Period. End of the story. Discussion over. Otherwise... We know the rich man died and went to hell. Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom prior to the death of Christ. That would be the equivalent of God's heaven now in the New Testament era. And so we understand that there are two destinations. We become God's property. He makes the choice. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. God makes the judgment where you go immediately after death. There is no room for hanging around. Now, there are people, of course, who want to believe this. There are people out there, these so-called paranormal experts, who have no confidence in the Word of God, no confidence in Scripture whatsoever. They want to believe that as a ghost you can hang around. They want to believe you can choose to remain. And these demons are more than happy to help them believe this. They're more than happy to provide all the ample evidence possible to make them believe a lie. Word of God talks about doctrines of devils, talks about the imaginations of the heart. He's more than happy to help you embrace a doctrine that is contrary to the Word of God, i.e., or for instance, a reincarnation, past life regression, so on and so forth. He's more than happy to provide evidence that causes you to believe these things because it contradicts the Word of God. And if it contradicts the Word of God, then there's no need whatsoever to believe the Gospel. There's no need whatsoever to obey the Gospel. One does not have to be saved. Everybody after death, it's going to be a party. You're going to have all kinds of choices available to you. And you'll be able to decide what you want to do. That is not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches, I said, that human spirits will wind up in one of two locations after death. Uh, there's no mention of lingering, remaining, wandering about in the land of the living. A ghost or a spiritual entity appearing in solid flesh and blood form would suggest, listen to me children, that the dead have the power to resurrect themselves at will. That is literally what would be happening. For a dead person, now in spirit form, to suddenly be able to appear to you literally flesh and blood so you can touch them, so you can feel them, they would have to have resurrected from the dead. Nowhere in the Word of God are we ever told, or is it ever suggested, that human beings have this power within themselves. As a matter of fact, the Word of God teaches that the only resurrection possible is through the power of God. The Word of the Lord tells us as believers that that same Spirit which dwelt in Christ, the Spirit of God, Paul said, now dwells in you. He said, it's by that same Spirit that raised him up from the dead that you one day will be raised up from the dead. So, there is no resurrection outside of God. So, to believe that a dead person, a spiritual being, can somehow manifest itself in a literal, physical, flesh and blood, tangible, touchable Form is to suggest that human beings have the ability to resurrect themselves after death at will. 
And again, this contradicts scripture. This tells us that God isn't necessary. We don't need God. There's no need of God. Look, look, this human, this spirit. Uh, there, I've read stories about women who have lost their husbands and then claim that their husband appeared to them and interacted with them even intimately after death. They physically experienced this. And um, I knew uh, a couple many years ago who claimed that when their child was uh, a, a child of theirs had died, and I want to say, I think he was about nine or ten years old, and honestly, the mother, she was a Christian lady, um, and the father was a preacher for that matter, and um, it really drove her about to the point of a nervous breakdown. And this man and this woman told me one day, that on occasion, the Lord, this is what they told me, the Lord would bring their son to them so that he could visit with them and they could talk with him. Folks, this contradicts the word of God. This has no foundation in Scripture. What are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the word of God or are we not? This notion again suggests that certain aspects of what God has promised and what God has said in his word are not true. The word of the Lord said the dead have no remembrance. The word of God says the dead have no more inheritance. They have no more connection to this life whatsoever, which is a good thing. That's part of what makes heaven, heaven. All the pain, the struggle, the strife, the bad relationships, the, uh, the hurts, all of those things are forgotten. They are literal. You literally, those things are separated from you and are forgotten. That's part of what makes heaven, heaven. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I got a 89-year-old great-grandmother that I was blessed beyond measure to have had until I was uh, 30 years old. And my great-grandmother passed from this life full of the Holy Ghost, and she went to her reward. I don't want to think for one second. I would not, as a child of God who believes the Scriptures, who believes the Word of the Lord, I would not want to think for one second that my grandmother was even minutely connected to this life. My grandmother was a worrywart. She worried about her kids. She worried about her grandkids. She worried about her great-grandkids. She was uh, tended to be a little on the anxious side. She was a, fa a person of faith, great faith. But, you know, she loved her family with such passion. And for all of that, I don't want Grandma worrying about me and the struggles I'm going through. My God, she's got uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. My Lord, if she were still connected to this life, she would have nothing but worry and trouble. She would constantly be watching her kids going through struggles, sickness, disease, you know, uh, family troubles, divorce, and uh, all kinds of hideous things. But thank God when we leave this life, we leave those things behind. We looked in our study at the fact spirits do not possess the necessary biological elements to produce sound, smells, or to affect the natural world in such a way as to create sounds like footsteps or walking. How does a spirit create footsteps on the floor. How do you hear something walking on the floor that is spiritual? How? That's like saying you could blow steam against the floor and create a sound by blowing steam against the floor. It's either spiritual 
or it's natural. You can't have it both ways. Oh, but a spirit can manifest itself uh, at least partially. Well, then why would a spirit manifest itself in such a manner as to allow you to hear it and somehow it's manifesting itself uh, and you see this all the time on these paranormal TV shows. They're standing there in the hallway, looking down the hallway, and they say, I heard footsteps coming toward me. I heard it coming in my direction, but I couldn't see anything. Well, how do you do that? How do you not have enough substance to be seen, but have enough substance to create weight on the floor so as to create the sound of footsteps. How, when the Word of God tells us, naked I came into this world, and naked I shall depart, we cannot bring anything into this life, and it is true, we cannot take anything out, then how come, uh, I, I watched a program the other day, and this lady was talking, and she said, and I could hear clearly what sounded like high-heeled shoes. And then sometimes people say, I could hear clearly what sounded like boots, or I could hear clearly what sounded like spurs, you know, uh, cowboy spurs on their, on the heel of their boot, you know. And how is it all these things transpire? How is it that the dead who are spirit, all of a sudden, not only are they Harry Potter magical and able to resurrect themselves from the dead on occasion to appear flesh and blood. Not only are they able uh, to appear in a form that is visible and that you can see at will, uh, but also at the same time, they have this magic power where they can literally uh, wear an outfit that they owned in this life. As if clothing and those sorts of things are not part of the physical realm. How does clothing and shoes and all of these props, how do they translate into the spiritual realm? How How is that? Oh, she was wearing a dress that we buried her in. Really? And just how did she get that dress into the spirit realm? Oh, she was wearing an outfit that she used to love to wear. Really? Is that so? And you don't realize that a demon spirit is presenting itself as someone and it is using uh, wardrobe and props in order to establish its identity. Because again, we know it cannot be the spirit of that individual according to the word of God. Spirits don't have... Uh, Voice boxes. A voice box is a physical, <laughs> that's, that's a physical thing. The interesting thing to me is I, uh, if you have ever seen people who claim to have had a post-death experience and then they've been revived and they say, I went to heaven and I saw the Lord or, you know, I saw people that I knew or what have you. One of the most common things that you will hear is they'll say, I was able to communicate with him without saying a word. It was like literally I thought the thought and then he responded and I could hear the response. I never had to vocalize. I never had to speak a word. Well, in spirit form, that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? That in spirit form it wouldn't be necessary. You don't have a voice box at that point. You don't have a stomach to growl. You don't have a esophagus to belch. You don't have uh, a, a polluted lung uh, with cancer that makes you cough. No, none of these things exist in the spirit realm. So when these spirits are using all these sounds and all these, I refer to them as props, you know, it's, they're literally putting on a little skit. They're putting on a little play. And they're using all these props in order to convince you that this is the spirit of, oh, this old man who died in this house, and bless his heart, he died of emphysema, or he died of 
uh, lung cancer, you know. And they say he used to cough up the lung all the time. And I can hear him coughing. Or this old lady lived in this house and she used to love to bake. And uh, I was told she used to love to bake. And and uh, we woke up some mornings and we could smell. We could literally smell just as real as you can smell it. As if someone had been baking pies or someone had baked a cake. Yet they go out in the kitchen, there's no pie, there's no cake. But the smell is there. And people cannot understand that these are props. This is how the enemy, these are things that he can do. We have no evidence in Scripture that the dead can do any of these things in, as a spirit. But we know that the enemy, the spirits of uh, angels and demons, but in this instance demons, are able to do all of these sorts of things. So how is it we cannot understand the reality of what we're dealing with? All of the attributes which are ascribed to ghosts are associated and ascribed in Scripture to the spirit realm, meaning angels and demons. Everything these so-called paranormal experts say that a ghost can do, we know from Scripture for a fact that angels and demons can do these things. So, is it possible we can be in a car wreck and a physical flesh and blood man can come to our aid and pull us out of the wreck and put us, you know, off to the side safely until the uh, authorities get there and help gets there. And when we look three seconds after they dragged us out of the car, that person is nowhere to be found. Is that possible for an angel? Yes, it is. Is it possible for a demon to present itself physically so that it is able to interact with the grieving wife or the grieving husband and literally present itself as the physical uh, incarnation of that individual? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And if they can do that, then how is how does it not follow that they can create coughing noises. They can create uh, the sound of belches and breaking wind and whistling and sneezing and coughing and you name it. If they can manifest themselves in the physical realm, then they certainly can manifest, even if they manifest themselves literally for three seconds simply to cough, to create that sound. But one way or another, we know that they are able to do these things. So, how can we not understand that what we are dealing with is not uh, the spirit of the dead? The spirit of the dead are uh, receiving their reward. They are where God has determined they ought to be. God does not use, we've, we've looked at this in the course of our study, God does not use or permit fear. Fear is contrary to God. The word of the Lord said, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So therefore, there is literally a spirit of fear. So God is, doesn't operate in the realms of fear. When an angel appears and it's, it strikes anxiety in your heart because it's like one minute he's not there, the next minute he is. When an angel appears, the testimony of Scripture, and you see it every single time, every single time you see the angel say, Fear not, fear not, don't be afraid. And when an angel speaks those words, literally what it does, it literally ministers peace to your spirit so that that fear dissipates. They're not just, they're literally doing in effect what Jesus did at the calming of the seas. He said, um, peace 
be still. He's speaking. He's not just saying, do this, but he is saying, this is what I want. I am creating peace by speaking peace. And when the angel says, fear not, they are literally speaking to the situation so that that fear dissipates. And anyone who's ever had an encounter with an angel as an angel will tell you that the, the, the angel did exactly what I've just said. The first thing they said was, don't be afraid, fear not. Um, demons we've studied in the course of this study. We're almost done uh, this week. And actually, maybe instead of moving forward, I should save that for next week. Uh, because we actually still have more to go here. I've got a good bit yet, so let's save that for next week since it is almost at the half hour, 8.30. We try to make our Bible study stay within roughly 90 minutes. I have a bad habit of yakking a little bit, doing an invite to church and what have you at the end, which makes it a little bit longer. I hope, folks, that this study is proving to be a blessing to you. I hope you're learning something. I hope more than anything in this universe, I hope that you are finding it in your heart to be more and more and more committed to believing the Word of God and rejecting those outside uh, influences which would cause us to bring into question the eternal, never-changing Word of God. That's what I hope more than anything through the course of this study. I hope your confidence in the Word of God grows and grows and grows. You will find victory. You will find deliverance. You'll find healing. Uh, if you can just find faith and confidence in the Word of God. Scripture declares, let God be true and every man a liar. Every man a liar. And if you want to believe ghosts are men and women that have died, then let them be a liar because the word of God is true. God, again, the word of the Lord declares, God is not a man that he should lie. God does not lie. Every word of God, the scriptures teach us, is true. Hallelujah. All right, we want to go to the Lord in prayer as we close this session this evening. Master, we love you, God, once again. We thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time in the presence of the Lord we've had tonight. Lord, I've felt the Holy Ghost so many times as I was teaching, and uh, we discussed such wonderful, positive, powerful things that my spirit within me wanted to rise up and shout. And Lord, I thank you for the victory that we have through the presence of God. I thank you for the authority we're given as believers through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the revelation of one God in Christ and Jesus is his name. I thank you for an understanding of the biblical mandate for full salvation. Acts 2, 38 and 39. I thank you, Lord, that you willingly assist and lead us through the Word of God as we study its pages. You do not, Lord, leave us to our own devices, but the anointing which we have received of God teaches us all things. And Lord, I'm grateful for the knowledge that we have in these areas that we're studying today. Help us, Lord, to put our confidence always in the Word of God and help us to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost as the enemy would come and attempt to vex or would attempt to oppress or even possess. We pray, God, that you would help us to walk in the authority and in the power of the Holy Ghost. Let your presence descend right now in the name of Jesus upon every home that is under the sound of my voice. Those 
Lord, right now who are going through vexation, those who are going through the oppression of the enemy, those who are experiencing spiritual things right now in the name of Jesus, Satan, you're a liar and the father of lies. You have no power in the life of a child of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you upon the authority of God's word, and we cast you forth as dung. Every spirit of depression, every spirit of despondency, every spirit of negativity, every spirit of bitterness, every spirit that would exalt itself against the higher knowledge of the living God, right now in the name of Jesus, I speak deliverance and victory into the life, God, of everyone that hears this word at this moment. Devil, you're a liar. You don't even know how to speak the truth. And we reject you in the name of Jesus. The word of God promising draw nigh unto God. He will, he will, he will draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. My Jesus declared, I give you power over all the works of the enemy, all spirits, every demonic power from hell, and there is nothing that shall by any means harm you. And Master, we claim that promise right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, go with Tommy and I as we travel to Kentucky this week. I pray, Lord, that you would send a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the believers who gather at this conference. Lord, let this not be some tidy little meeting, but let it be an outbreak of revival that people will be able to bring each individually to their own homes, to their own churches, to their own states their own cities, how I need a touch of the Holy Ghost, how I need, Lord, for you to use me. And I pray, God, that uh, you would anoint me and use me in this meeting in a wonderful, powerful way to help people find reconciliation. Those who have known you but have backslidden and fallen away, let them be reconciled. Those who have never known you, let them come, Lord, to be saved. And Lord, today I pray let healing flow mightily through that place. Let the Holy Ghost flow through and fill believers to overflowing. We ask all this tonight, O oh God, and none other than Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Glorious, glorious name. For there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Amen. Praise God and amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I felt the Lord during the course of this study. I hope you have too. Folks, I want to invite you to be with us um, Sunday at 3 o'clock for our uh, celebration of life in Christ. As I've said, there will be a, there will be a, a service as normal. Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. You can watch it here either on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, and then, of course, I hope you'll join us next week. Apparently, we're still going to continue in this study, Ghost Schools and Bumps in the Night. Until we see you the next time, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer. <laughs>